Hi, this is Harsha, and I'm delighted to have my good friend Emily West here with us today. Hi, Emily. Hi, Harsha. Always such a pleasure to see you. Brilliant. And so, so uh, thanks so much, Emily, for joining us today. Um, I had the pleasure of interviewing Emily on episode nine of the Reframe and Reset Your Career podcast. And Emily kindly invited me to collaborate with her on an interview for Thrive Global on careers. And we thought it would be helpful dis to discuss some of the points made in the interview. But firstly, Emily, do you want to quickly remind us about your background and maybe um, talk about how we first came across each other? Yeah, absolutely. Let me try and do the short version. Um, I did a degree in economics and I went into investment banking and I had a 14 year career, which was amazing and covered lots of different areas, including fixed income research, marketing, customer experience. And ultimately, I ended up as head of leadership for RBS Investment Bank. And I had a great experience, I have to say, I learned a lot along the way. Um, but also, I had an experience of ill health while I was going through that process and I developed chronic fatigue syndrome. And so I developed this real interest in well-being and went off and secretly did a degree in nutritional therapy as I, as I recovered and got better. And then in my last role as head of leadership, as well as running the leadership coaching team, I set up the wellbeing program for RBS Investment Bank. And then I left to run my own business, which was really exciting. And we'll probably talk a bit about that today. And then in that process, I started doing, I, mean, I was already a coach for, for people on their careers and building confidence and public speaking, but also I could use my wellbeing experience. So I started running workshops and wellbeing programs for other companies. And that's how we met because we were discussing wellbeing in the context for, for CFA members. And so we just, we just got chatting about that. And then Harsha came up with this brilliant podcast and I basically begged him to let me on it. And that's, and that's basically how that episode happened. <laughs> and, and, and the rest is history. <laughs> and the rest is history. And we can't stop talking. So that's it. the conversation continues, right? It never ends. But, but, but I think the great thing about having these conversations, Emily, I think is sometimes you have these ideas in your head, but it's only actually when you talk to somebody that they fully almost materialize. And, and, and maybe also you can say, oh, that doesn't work, but maybe this does. And I think the whole advantage of a conversation is that you are trying to um, articulate your thoughts and sometimes your thoughts don't make any sense, but it's only by writing them down or talking to somebody like yourself that um, it, it makes sense. Um, and sometimes even with your careers, I think it's a really helpful thing to dis discuss them with somebody else. Absolutely. I mean, that's, you know, my career as a, as a career coach is, is really based on that, is that my clients need a sounding board, they need someone to challenge them, to encourage them. And I know from my experience, when I'm stuck on something, the best thing I can do is talk it through with someone else and then I can work it through. But it's also why the podcast format works so well, because I think it's much more interesting to listen to two people discussing something and bouncing ideas off each other than to just listen to someone do a keynote, which can also be amazing. But I really enjoy listening to this format as well as you know, doing this format with you. Yeah, no, uh, brilliant. And so let, let's sort of dive straight in. So why do you think it's important for people to examine their career path? Well, I mean, the first obvious point is you spend so long normally at work. I mean, it's such a big chunk of your, your life. So don't sleepwalk into a job you don't like doing and waste a load of time being miserable. But also for most people, it's how we contribute. I mean, we might contribute outside of work, through charitable work, through with our families and friends. But for most of us, it is a big way we contribute and have a sense of purpose. So, so when you get it right, and we all know this, when you have a job that you love, when you feel like your work is meaningful, when you're playing to your strengths, it feels so good. And when you're in a job that you really don't like, working with people you don't respect and, you know, maybe even being set up to fail or having a bad experience, it's, it's really tough. It affects every aspect of your life. So really, I want to encourage people, you don't, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have every day has to be the most amazing day at work, but you should consciously navigate your career in a way that means it's, it's really rewarding for you. And also you can make a really positive contribution. I know, I, I, I totally agree. And I think it's very much about being strategic. And that was part of the reason for starting the podcast, apart from my uh, interest in neuroscience and um, psychology. I think it's really about being strategic, thinking about your career uh, and not let it happen to you. Because I think sometimes mm -hmm. people, you you get a good job, um, maybe you're straight out of university and you just carry on with it. And at the beginning, it, it starts well, but then maybe you're not being developed um, as, as well as you'd like. 
And I think it's about asking yourself those questions. You know, do I see myself um, here for, for a period of time? Are there promotion opportunities? Am I learning something? Um, and it's constantly, I think, trying to be honest with yourself. And it, it is difficult, but I think it's better to have those uh, discussions before something, uh, if you're not happy, before something really bad happens. Um, don't, don't you think so? Well, I, I think that, you know, you and I both worked in investment banking. And it's easy to get caught up in the in the culture and the money and the prestige of different job titles. So I just think sometimes people just they just go quite a long way down that road before they realize it's not actually making them happy because they get really caught up in that. And, and sometimes that is the right thing for people. So, you know, I had a great time in investment banking. It's not that that's a bad career, but any career you can get a bit caught up in it. And that's where it's really important to take time out and reflect on on what's important for you. And to that point as well, of, is this is this right for me? One of the questions I ask my clients is, when you look at your boss or your boss's boss, do you think, oh, I'd love to be them? I'd love, not just I'd love to have that job, I'd love to have that whole life. You know, what's their life balance? And I have to say a lot of my clients in the city say, absolutely no, I wouldn't want to be like that person in that role. And then I go, okay, well, you know, that's the direction you're heading right now. So do we need to do a course correction basically on this? So I just think, look ahead, look at the people around you. And if, you, if you're really inspired by them, that's really good. But if you're thinking, God, I don't, I don't want to end up like that, then you need to make a change. Yeah, and I think that's a great point you make about um, motivation, because I think sometimes when people are looking into the future, you have to really ask yourself, why, why am I doing this job? Um, mm. What is the real reason behind it? And if it's for these um, material, and I'm not saying you know, money and having a good time are not, are not important reasons. But you really have to ask yourself, you know, what is the why? And, and really ask yourself, is this something that I really want to be doing? Um, and uh, can I align my, my job with my values or is it attached to uh, something that I enjoy? I mean, maybe if you're in an in investment management firm and you love to do research, then that's a great thing that effectively your job is aligned with what you enjoy doing and you're good at. But really, do if it's just for the money and the status, that's very hard to sustain on a long-term basis. Um, and what, what do you think, Emily? Well, and some people are really motivated by money and status and it genuinely makes them very happy. But often those are goals that you have, you have a goal to get to a certain amount and you think I'll be happy when I get there. And it's amazing with my clients, I help them achieve amazing things and they get there and they're happy for about a day and then they're onto the next goal. So what they're missing, and this is so cheesy to say, but it's actually about the journey. There's no point having a goal if you're not going to enjoy doing what you need to do to get there because your life is made up of you know sprints and and periods of time where you're working towards goals and then you achieve them but then you know i think of my first goals and i was so happy when i achieved them but i wouldn't be happy with them now you've got to kind of keep moving on so i, I sometimes think people miss that and they they don't they don't think so much about it. it's the how how am i achieving that is just as important as what i'm achieving but I, you know, I was head of fixed income research for a time in an investment bank, and I had the most amazing people in my department who are absolutely fascinated, almost obsessed with what they write research on. And they were the number one ranked researchers, and they absolutely loved what they did, and they were great at it. They were completely in the right role for them. I started out as a research analyst and quickly realized that wasn't the right role for me because I didn't love you know, 14 hours a day in front of a spreadsheet. I wasn't actually as into the, the research and the numbers as my colleagues were. I was much more into people and management. And when I worked that out and I got into management, suddenly my career took off because I was playing to my strengths. So that, to me, that's a fundamental question as well is, is this role making the best use, best use of what I'm good at? That's like a really key question because if the answer is no, you're probably in the wrong spot. Yeah, no, I, I, I to totally agree with that, Emily. And then sort of moving on to mindset, which is, I think, something that is very mm. close to our hearts. Um, what, what sort of, you know, what, is there a particular mindset, do you think, that it takes to um, achieve a, a fulfilling career? Yeah, I, I thought about this ahead of our conversation because I remember us talking about this. And I think there's three things, positivity, um, resilience, and discipline. So it does help to have, a positive attitude because 
careers can be challenging and we can easily have our confidence knocked and develop imposter syndrome, all those things. So when I work with my clients, often we're working on building their confidence and having a positive attitude that even if things don't seem to be going well, that there might be a lesson, there might be a positive outcome in the, in, in the end. Um, resilience is so key because if you are going to be ambitious, you're also going to fail. And, and you should, I, I think if you're failing, it's a good sign because you're trying. You know, that's what my snowboarding instructor said to me. If you're not falling over, you're not trying. I mean, I fall over professionally, so I, I was definitely trying, but being resilient and tough, I think that's key. And it, it, sometimes it's hard, but I think sometimes we need to just draw on that inner grip. Um, and then the final one is discipline, because I think you and I talked about it before that it's great to have goals, it's great to have a vision, but then you've got to take action to make it happen. You know, I was coaching a client last night who's got the most amazing new job for an amazing organization. And when she told me, it's completely unprecedented, I actually cried in the coaching session because I was so happy for her. And it was just such an amazing outcome that I could never have imagined. So it was so great. But that just didn't happen by luck. She did all the things it took to get there, including taking herself out of her comfort zone, including, you know, actively applying and pursuing the right roles. So there is a certain discipline that that if you want to really succeed in your career and have a fulfilling career, there is a certain amount of hard work that has to go into it. You have to be prepared to do it. So positivity, resilience, discipline. I think that's the, the recipe. But have I, have I missed anything, Harsha? No, I, I think you cover it that very nicely. And I especially like the execution part because I, I think there are a lot of people who are looking for these bits of advice, which they think will change their life and change their career. But actually, yeah. there are, as we've talked about before, there are no real silver bullets. I think it's very much about execution. And if you don't execute, things just won't work out well. But, but I think a couple of other points I would add are uh, being able to be adaptable and comfortable with change. Um, the, the point also about resilience, I think that is you know, very important but also things like uh, controlling what you can control. Um, and, I, and I think with uncertainty, you know, the world I think is changing so rapidly and so mm -hmm. much faster mm -hmm. than, than we wanted to change. You look at what's going on with the climate change in COP26, and you think things like say the financial crisis in 2008, you thought oh, that's a once in a generational type thing going on. You, you think COVID, that's another once in a generational. <laughs> But, but I think all these things are happening faster and faster. So I think if you can prepare yourself for uh, change and, and try and make yourself as adaptable as possible. And I, I'm not saying that's easy because I think as human beings, we're wired to, uh, uh, we, we like habits. We like doing things the same all the time. But I think going forward, that's just not gonna be possible. So in a way, in the back of your mind, just accept, look, almost map it out in a decision tree. Um, okay, if I lose my job, if I don't get promoted, if my boss changes, how am I going to adapt? And I'm not saying it's always going to be possible to adapt uh, exactly in the way you want. But I think if you're thinking about those things, that that does help. Um, but, but also the other point I think is helpful is things like, you know, control, because um, I think there's much more in our lives that we can control. Um, and sometimes when things aren't going um, the way we plan, we feel lost. I remember you made this point about control during uh, COVID that um, try and uh, find things which you can control. Do you want to maybe expand on that? Because I think there were some really good points. Yeah, I mean, COVID was, you know, the whole pandemic has been a huge challenge. But one of the things that was really challenging was the, the rules kept changing of what we couldn't couldn't could and couldn't do. And also the experts couldn't predict. I mean, it was an impossible situation to predict exactly what was going to happen. So we do have a certain amount of routine in our lives and that gives us a certain comfort and structure. And having that lets us have freedom and play and have, have variety and challenge in other ways. But a lot of that structure, like the routines, where we went to work, certainty about our jobs, so, you know, financial certainty, a lot of that certainty just went out the window. It's almost like you just took the foundation of a house away. So that makes a lot of people go into high anxiety and people are still dealing with that now. And really what I was coaching people is, is put in structure where you can. Create a new routine, even if, you, even if that's a routine that you'll only stick to for four weeks until the rules change again. But try and give yourself that, it comes back to discipline as well. Try and give yourself a daily structure, a daily routine, 
if you're thinking about traveling but you don't know what the rules are just say i accept i can't travel for the next six weeks i will, I will plan accordingly it's almost like if you don't know what the rules are you have to create your own rules to give that structure and security but the same goes you know in adversity in your career something happens at work there's a restructure you're not in a position to influence the outcome of the restructure but what can you control you can control how well you do your job you can control your personal brand which is something i always talk about but you can think about who are the key stakeholders how do i come across to them you can make sure that you put your best foot forward learn as much as you can while you're there maybe there's a redundancy coming so what can you get out of this job before you leave and take control of all of those things and then and then the outcome in a way doesn't matter because you've still turned that into a positive experience but you're more likely to have a better outcome than if you just sit there in a bit of a stress and a panic about it no i i just love that point i think it's really just taking ownership of the situation you know, whatever it is because as mm. you're saying even if it's not good there are always these small things that you could be doing you know reaching out to your colleagues trying to get their contact details before your company <laughs> email goes but get it, it, there's always something there's always something you can do and I, I would just want to come back to the point you made earlier about flexibility harsh because this is so important about you're absolutely right the day of a job for life is gone you and we don't know what our work environment will be like in 10 years time you and i will be holograms or something like that <laughs> i don't like I, I have no idea i'm excited so we have to train ourselves to be really good at adapting to change and you can train yourself and one of my favorite books i'm looking over it at my bookshelf because it's still there is feel the fear and do it anyway by susan jeffers this is an old classic i get a lot of my clients if they suffer from anxiety i get them to read it and in it she kind of trains you to just do things you're afraid of but it's also kind of just find new challenges just make yourself do something new really regularly i mean at least once a month if not once a week do something that's just brand new to you and it really trains you to actually be resilient in the face of having to suddenly do something brand new and you also start to really enjoy the challenge it goes from anxiety anxiety to kind of excitement and you're like oh i'm going to do something new i wonder how this will turn out instead of thinking oh god there's something new i don't know what's going to happen and you can really train yourself i i completely use her book to train myself that now if something new comes up or someone asks me to do something and it's maybe not something i've done before i get all excited and i think great i i want to do this challenge so now I'm really comfortable with change, but I wasn't always comfortable with change. That is something I trained myself to deal with. So anyone watching who gets a bit anxious about doing new things or, or dealing with change outside of work in a safe environment, start challenging yourself and you can train yourself to get to the point that you love change. Yeah, no, no, totally. And, and it just changes your mindset and almost reframing the way you look at the world, you know, rather than mm. this is a, a problem, actually, this is an opportunity. And, and maybe you know, losing your job or things not going well at work, this is an opportunity to actually look outside. Um, and maybe you haven't been getting acknowledged or paid what you deserve at work. And sometimes people get very caught up and, oh my God, I can't leave, or oh my God, mm. I can't have a, 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 a frank conversation with my boss. But actually yeah. sometimes going outside um, your working environment and speaking to friends or even a headhunter or whatever, you can get a true idea of what your real market value is like. Um, oh, so, yeah, yeah there's, there's that sunk cost, isn't there? When someone's worked somewhere for a really long time and they go, but I've got this network, I've, you know, I've built up contacts, I've got this knowledge and they find, kind of feel if they leave, they're throwing that all the, out the window. But actually what my clients find is they leave and they go somewhere else and they go to that place as a more experienced hire. And the reason those people value them is because of all that knowledge and experience they bring with them. And, and it's actually a huge boost to confidence for most people when they move somewhere else. And they and a lot of them say, oh, I wish I'd done it sooner. Yeah, and, and actually that's a great point you make, which suddenly came to me now, is that your network is actually with you. And, and a, mm. a friend of mine made this point on another podcast. It, actually, nowadays, rather than loyalty directly to your company, it's actually to your network, because those are the people who, in times of need, will come up with information about jobs or give you advice. Um, and obviously, we're not saying don't work hard for your company and don't be loyal to them. But on the other hand, I think be realistic because it's a sort of a two way street in a way that obviously they're getting something out of you, you're getting something out of them, but obviously there's a bigger picture going on and you don't know how the world is changing, do you? 
no you don't and in, look it's it's business no one expects you to stay in your job forever unless you have obviously tenure as a university professor it's not expected of you and at the same time you, you might be really loyal to a company and then they have to go through a resizing and they just let you go on a moment's notice and it, you just can't take these things personally so absolutely you should always be looking to make a positive contribution wherever you are but you should also be thinking about your own career and what's best for you and not be afraid to leave when it's the right time yeah and, and actually I, mean, I love that point and i, I know that uh, neither of us give dating advice but actually sometimes <laughs> In, in personal <laughs> relationships you can take a lot of these analogies from that and put it into your career if you oh. get rejected don't take it personally move don't on take, <laughs> but i always think is yeah i don't give relationship advice but i end up talking to my clients about how particularly job interviews are like dating first of all you have to kiss a lot of frogs for sure <laughs> to find a prince always and that's good practice but also you mustn't take it personally you get ghosted in the interview process that completely happens you mustn't take it personally people are super busy old school manners which i love have gone out the window so actually it, it's very similar but it's also similar when you leave you know a lot of our longest relationships are with it's quite depressing but they're with an employer not with a person and when you leave you know i left rbs after 10 years that's a long time and it, it can in some ways feel like a breakup and I coach clients who are leaving, you know, long term employment to go somewhere else. I kind of coach them through the emotional side of that because it is emotional and it can feel quite hard to leave and it feels safe and secure, but maybe there's something much more um, exciting and even better for you on the other side of that. So yeah, there's lots of uh, amusing similarities there. <laughs> but, but should you date two people at once in terms of the interview process? <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, it, I'm not going to comment on the dating world. I'm really old school about that. So I find all, I find modern dating terrifying. But in terms of work wise, yeah, you should look at all look at all the opportunities, have all the conversations. Don't rule things out until you've really decided you don't want a job. I get clients all the time saying, oh, I don't want to go for that interview because I'm not sure I want it. And if they offer it to me, I'll feel bad. And I'm just like, oh my God, it's like you just did the entire interview process in your head. You didn't even let that company interview you, which is insane. Go for the interview. They can decide if they like you or not. And you can decide if you like them or not. There's no obligation at the end of it for either of you. But so many people, it's so interesting, they hold themselves back because it's really nice. They're worried about the personal impact. But at the end of the day, this is business. I do believe in being professional, authentic, trustworthy you know i'm super honest and i i value that in other people do be that through the process but don't sell yourself short because you're too worried about other people's feelings this is about work at the end of the day no i t totally agree um and just in terms of uh passion now people are always thinking about i want to follow my passion and find mm. a career path which i'm passionate about and unless it, i'm totally in, uh, happy with it and it's going to fulfill me, then I'm not going to do it. I mean, what, what are your views on that, Emily? I mean, it's a, it's a lovely idea that every single day of our, our work, we would just love it. I mean, I love what I do, but I still have moments where I'm doing something and I think, oh, I'd rather be, you know, I'd rather be out on a walk with my dog or I'd rather be hanging out with my friends than doing this specific thing. So I do think it's good to do something you enjoy. But passion is an interesting thing because sometimes a passion, it's just a hobby. And maybe you love doing that thing as a hobby, but do you have what it takes to do it professionally? And if you do it professionally, will you ruin it for yourself? You know, I've, I've worked before with actors and it's really interesting because you think, oh, they're doing what they love. But actually when they get a play in the West End, they then have to do that play twice a day, six days a week for three months. And they get bored of it really quickly. <laughs> and you forget that, you think, oh, how glamorous. So. I think if you've got a passion and you're thinking about turning it into a career, I always believe in exploring. Go and talk to people who do that professionally or just try it out professionally. Just try doing it for a week and really see if it's something you enjoy as a job or do you enjoy it as a hobby. In a way, I think I'm more in favor of playing to your strengths at work. And I think that does align with pleasure. So really spend time. Don't just think about things you, you're passionate about, but think about what you're really good at. You know, are you someone who's really good with people or are you really good with operations with logistics are you great with numbers are you highly analytical are you highly emotionally intelligent are you great in a crisis are you someone who brings people together you know think about all those things think about what you're really good at and what you find easier than other people and start to look for work that's aligned with that 
And I find people who do that end up in, in jobs that they really enjoy, but not just that they enjoy, but they're really good at. And that is, it is important to be good at your job because that's how you end up being successful. But also no one likes to feel like an underperformer. Oh, no, I, I totally agree with that. Uh, and it, it's funny, uh, before I, I was very much of the view, oh yeah, you've got to be super passionate about your job. And, and that was the only thing. And you had to sort of uh, follow this lifelong passion and very much along the sort of Steve Jobs Stanford commencement speech. But then I read this book, um, which you might see here, so good they can't ignore you. And that's by <laughs> Cal, Cal, Cal Newport. Uh, this is just to prove that the books I do talk about, I actually do read them and have them. Um, but he, he, he very much talks about, you know, forget about this passion thing to some extent, because it's very hard sometimes to turn pre-existing passions in, into careers, as we talked about, and really try and find things that you're good at and achieve a level of mastery. And actually, when you are really good at something and you have this level of mastery, then actually you start enjoying it. And it's this sort of virtuous reinforcing uh, circle, isn't it? Um, and it is. then pe people come to you uh, for your thoughts and opinions. It is. And it's also kind of thinking a bit laterally about how you use your strengths. So, you know, if, if you or I had taken on careers related to our passions, you'd be a professional cricketer, right? And I'd, pro <laughs> I'd probably be a fashion designer slash musician. Now, I'm not going to, you're very good at cricket, but I'm not going to speak to that. I'll speak to myself, right? I would not be an amazing um, fashion designer and musician. I love playing piano but I'm, I know what it takes to be at, at the level you know anyone who's not sure watch the film Whiplash which is amazing but I'm I'm never going to be at that level so I wouldn't be super successful at that but interestingly through doing things I am good at I have ended up coaching some people in the arts and I love that I'm then really helping them in their creative roles that are things I would love to do and if I, I have a, a client I, who also comes to mind a really lovely client who works in compliance and it happens that she does she loves compliance and she's very good at the law and, and all those aspects and regulation. So she really likes that. But again, she has this real creative side and she loves kind of fashion. And what ended up happening was, you know, through me coaching her and her, her working through finding a job, she ended up finding a compliance job for a private equity company that owns and invests in some of the biggest fashion brands that you have ever heard of. And then she got to be privy to the development of those brands. And so she got to enjoy that interest whilst doing what she was good at. You know, I've known all sorts of people have gone and worked as accounts in a record label. So there's a, there are lots of ways you can get involved in your passions without having to force yourself through the pain that I would have had to go through of failing as a musician, basically. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, that, I think that's, that's sort of great, um, great advice and, and great thoughts. And now just moving in terms of um, looking at strategies for finding a new job. Um, can you share some of your ideas and thoughts on this, um, Emily, just so that you know, people who are you know, watching us today, uh, practical things that they can uh, use to help them on their search? I mean, I think the key is to be very, very curious, as curious as you can be. So, you know, the classic way is, Go and look on LinkedIn or Total Jobs, see what jobs are advertised, speak to some recruiters, absolutely do those things. But I want you to be inquisitive much more broadly. So reach out to people, you know, have coffee, send people a few questions on LinkedIn. People send me questions all the time on LinkedIn about my career, and I'm happy to answer them. And, you know, just read around about companies you might be interested in. You see a job advertised, don't just apply for it. Really study that company. What's interesting about it? Or do they have a sister company or another branch or something else? And just, it's kind of like follow your nose, but give yourself a bit of space. Don't rush into the first job. Give yourself some space to go exploring and then talk to people. If you're, if you're making a bit of a move, so say you want to move diagonally, you want to do a slightly different job or move into a different sector. It's easy to sit there and think about it and convince yourself that this is the answer. This is the perfect job, but you don't know. Go and find people in that sector and talk to them and find out what it's like. And if you love it, then you'll do really well at interview because they'll, you'll have done your research. And if you don't know the right person to talk to, ask your friend. Say, actually, I really want to move into a job in research, for example. Does anyone know someone in research I can talk to? And that, that happened in my career where I had an interview for a job and I didn't really know what I was doing. And I said to my friends, does anyone know anyone who in that organization, in that area. And they put me in touch with someone who then gave me loads of good advice ahead of my interview. So you, 
use the network and ask for help instead of just sitting there on your own trying to just apply for jobs you know without talking to anybody just it's almost like you're deciding what the solution is you don't know look you don't know what your perfect job is i don't know what my perfect job is we're all discovering so go exploring but then it's like it's like buying houses you have to look at a lot of houses and then one day you go in one and you go i love this house and the price is right the same with jobs really explore as much as possible because then one day you'll have the interview or you'll have a contact with someone and you'll just suddenly be like oh okay this feels like a really good fit for me yeah and i i, I totally agree with you about this whole investigation process and doing the research because i think rather than thinking of uh, finding a new job as a problem it's actually a, a challenge or a puzzle that mm -hmm. you're trying to solve and you're almost like Sherlock Holmes or another famous yeah. detective thinking, OK, these are the bits of information. This is what I like doing. This is what's available in the market and try and marry the two up together. And I think the, this point you made about interviews actually go on as many interviews as possible, because the more you do it, the more polished you'll become. And, and we're not saying try and be uh, inauthentic and, and you, know, you have to be authentic. But I think there's a certain level of um, skill and polish, which comes from the more you interview. And actually just by going through that pressure of being in an interview, you come up with things that um, you wouldn't normally have thought of. I mean, I, I remember when we, I was looking at uh, the article that we had put together, thinking, you know, how did, how did we come up with this stuff? This seemed pretty, <laughs> pretty uh, good. But, and, and it's very much because you're not sometimes thinking about it, you're putting yourself in these uncomfortable positions. Um, do you think so? Well, absolutely. And I, I put my clients through live interview practice, which I deliberately make them a bit uncomfortable. So they get that experience before they go in front of someone who they really want to impress. And I always say, you know, prepare a lot in advance, do your research, practice your interview answers out loud over and over again. But then when you're in the interview, let all that go, stop trying to be perfect and just have a conversation. And you're also you're not just being interviewed you're trying to understand if they are people you want to work with so just have that natural conversation try and contribute maybe suggest an idea for them that you've had you know i had a client recently get a job and they just she just gave them some ideas in the interview and they were completely wowed by what she said but you know in the moment just relax and enjoy the process absolutely but practice is key you know i had a client the other day who's who's just gone for a very senior job somewhere but she hasn't had to interview in 10 years so if you look at her CV, you just think, wow, I mean, this person is so impressive. Surely they'll just give her the job. But then interviewing is a bit of a skill and she's not had to do it. So if she doesn't practice and prepare, prepare properly, she still might not come across as well as she should at interview. So absolutely practice as much as you can. And I think that's a great point about interviews because it's very much developing that chemistry and that's not that that easy to do in, in a few minutes because yeah you know, unfortunately people do make snap judgments quite quickly mm. so i think say if you're doing it over zoom make sure you practice you know the the lighting's good uh, you're wearing appropriate uh, clothing and, and also practice in the the clothes or the suit that you're going to wear because you know sometimes people think oh i'll just wear a t-shirt and jeans or whatever um and then when you actually wear the suit you're you you feel very uncomfortable so I think just get into the habit of, OK, whatever it is you're doing as a practice run through, treat it as a, a proper live interview, um, I think. Oh, completely. I had a super interesting um, conversation with someone recently. I was doing some yeah. workshops for his business and we were, and one of the workshops I ran was about personal branding and not just for interviews, but just for, for meetings, setting up your Zoom, you know, having quite a clear background dressing appropriately, talking about just that Zoom experience. And he said something had happened where he had interviewed somebody for a job and he really liked their CV, but in the interview, he felt like the other person was a bit uncomfortable and, and just wasn't relaxed where he was and he couldn't work it out. But the guy looked like he was at home and he couldn't work out, but he just, something was off with the interview and he also decided it wasn't the right candidate. And then he, he had a follow-up conversation with that guy later. And that guy actually wasn't in his own house. Ooh. What he had done is because he wanted to impress at the interview, he'd asked his friend who had a very impressive house if he could do the interview from that place. But then he wasn't in his natural environment. And, and that comes across, it's amazing what you can pick up even over Zoom. And so he'd not come across as natural and comfortable. So I think everything you're saying about practice how you're gonna dress, practice where you're going to sit, you know, have a comfortable chair, 
all these things can make a difference in how you come across. Oh, brilliant. And, and just on that point about personal branding, I think we both um, you know, understand how important it is. But you being the personal branding expert, Emily, do you want to give a few thoughts on that area? Well, yes. I mean, it makes a huge difference. You know, we all know people who are, let's put it frankly, not particularly great at their jobs, but really good at self-promotion who end up in very senior positions. Like we've all seen that. And we've also all seen people we work with who were absolutely brilliant and talented but very quiet and modest and they just get overlooked and they just quietly get on with their work so we know that brand and personal pr makes a huge difference and no one's going to do that for you you have to take control of your brand now i do whole workshops and talks on this but let me give you the really short version number one you must be visible there's no point being great at your job if no one knows about it so how do you make yourself visible how do you get in, you know, speak up in meetings? How do you get into meetings? How do you present in front of as, as many people as possible? Build up gradually, but you need to get used to that. What's your LinkedIn doing? Are you speaking at conferences? How are you being as visible as possible? Number two, authenticity, you've commented on it. Don't be fake, be yourself, work out what your strengths are and play to those because people can smell in authenticity. It catches you out eventually. And these days it's more and more important that you have values and you work to those people really value that and then the final one is authority now authority is about showing people what you're good at and what experience you bring so it's not about being the boss or being bossy it's about understanding everything you bring all that experience and then letting people know in a non you're not trying to brag but letting people know all the experience you bring and you can do that through using examples of work you've done before just giving really good advice being a thought leader on your social media there's loads of ways you can show that expertise, but often when we meet people that, you know, someone meets you harsh, they've got no idea until you talk about it. Um, you know, your amazing career experience, that all the awesome stuff you've done with the podcast, all the people you've interviewed, all the, I mean, the knowledge you have in your head is incredible, but no one knows that. And it's what you say that will help them understand that about you. So actually think about what are you saying to people? Are you just trying to be nice and affable? Or are you actually taking the opportunity to, to show people your experience when you introduce yourself? Do you give your job title? Do you share a little bit about where you've come from and position yourself with that authority straight away? And the final point on authority is how you dress. You know, if we dress professionally and we dress at the level we want to be at, people take us seriously. And if you dress like the junior or you dress super casually, like you don't take your job seriously, you whatever authority you have, you completely destroy it. So even in this interesting hybrid world of working from home and kind of business casual is a new dress code that nobody knows what that is, okay? <laughs> Complete nightmare, but still try and be one of the better dressed people in the room, in any room that you're in. And that really does make a difference. No, I think that those are some great points. And, and say, I think uh, if you're um, an introvert and you're not very good at selling yourself, perhaps you can find a group or a circle of people who can amplify uh, your voice and, and say, you know, you can produce stuff on um, create content, write an article, do it, do a podcast, create some videos, and then share that on LinkedIn. Because I think in terms of branding, there's an internal element, but there's also an external element as well. And I, I think both of those two bits are uh, important. And, and sometimes actually with the external piece, if you can get friends, uh, a group of people, and you all amplify each other's work, obviously not doing it in a transactional sort of way, but and, and also make sure that the work is good. But then that also helps that if you have somebody else who's saying, oh, Emily, that, that was a really interesting article or you know, great podcast, it's that third party validation. And especially from somebody outside your organization, then your boss looks at it and thinks, wow, this is, this is really good. Uh, Emily's in demand by other people, not just by my firm. And then when it comes to um, having a pay rise, it's much easier to have that conversation. Um, yeah. So I think, yeah, totally agree with the, the, the branding point. So just in terms of um, uh, your career and um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people staying conscious of um, getting to where they uh, want to be, are there any thoughts in terms of um, uh, strategies or ideas that you think are helpful? Because obviously we all get worried and overwhelmed and uncertain given what's going on at the moment. I think it's good to have an overall vision of, of, of what you want for the future. So 
are, are you really happy where you are? Do you just want more of that? You just want to be more senior or do you want something to change? Do you want to go self-employed? You know, I always had that in my vision that I would run my own business. That, that was in there somewhere. What environment would you work in? Would you work from home? Will you work from an office? Will you travel? Have that vision. But don't be too specific where you say, well, OK, the way I get there is I do this step, this step, this step. Think, think about that, but also be open to the fact that you might achieve your vision in another way. You might do a bit of a zigzag course like I did. So it's really good to kind of know where you're going and have a, a rough idea of how you might get there, but just stay open. And then what you want to do is to avoid this kind of sleepwalking where you just suddenly end up five years in a job and think, how did I spend this long here? I don't like it. You want a regular check-in so that i mean it's whatever works for you but for me i would set goals for the year at the start of the year and i would sit down every month and just check in am i tracking towards those goals what opportunities do i want to take you know we're talking about profile sometimes it's about working on a project that's high profile what high profile projects are going on how do i attach myself to them you know so so having that vision as a guiding principle and then on a monthly basis reviewing what you're doing checking in am i am i going in the right direction and then when you get offered a job or something changes and you have a decision to make you ask yourself does that does this decision take me closer or further away from my goal and vision and what i'm trying to achieve and that really helps you make that decision so for example when i got asked to be interim head of fixed income research which was a huge jump at that point for me huge jump and it was quite scary but because I had this very clear vision of what I wanted to achieve, which included being a senior manager, I just knew in that moment when they offered that to me, the question, does it take me closer or further away from that? 100% this job takes me closer to achieving my goal. So it doesn't matter how afraid I am, how much imposter syndrome I had, how much I thought no one would respect me as their boss because I was younger than most of them, all those thoughts going through my head, it didn't matter. I knew that I just had to say, yes, thank you. I would love to do it. And I would work it out. And I did. So I think that's a really good way of making decisions as well as you go through. So have a clear vision, but regularly check in, are you moving towards it? And each decision point again, does this take me closer or further away? And I think that's a great point you made about just yeah, ha having an idea of where you're trying to get to, because sometimes when you have these opportunities and, and they, they can sometimes come out of the blue. And if you're not uh, on it, you might say something silly or even reject it without even mm. thinking about it and actually and, and and actually i would flip things around reframe it in, in the sense of if these people and and remember all companies you work for these are not charities they're not doing things because you're a nice person they're doing it because they can see you're adding value and the value you're adding is far greater than what their their compensation so actually, you you should say to yourself, um, and actually, if I've ever been offered a promotion, I've thought, look, uh, if these people are willing to offer this to me and they're going to pay me a bit more money, then actually they, they're they not silly people. There is a rational reason that they're doing this. Just take it, even if you don't think you're maybe quite capable at that point in time. There are things that you can do to uh, improve yourself. And I, I, th I think a lot of it is just hard work and, and asking your network. Um, what, what do you think, Emily? Well, completely. When I was in that scenario and I accepted the job and then I went in the bathroom and thought, oh, my God, what's just happened? How do I do this? But I immediately sought out a mentor who had done that job before. And I and I reached out to my network. I already had a good network, but I reached out to some senior people and said, I'd like your help in me doing this. And they were delighted to help me. So I then had a team who were there to help me be successful. So absolutely, I agree with all of that. The only thing I would say is sometimes you will get offered a promotion and sometimes a lot of money to do something because it's in the business's interest, but it might not be a job that makes you happy. So you also, if you're very clear on what you want in life, sometimes you have to make tough decisions and sometimes you have to turn things down. It doesn't happen so often, but it does happen. If you're very clear what's important to you, what your values are, what kind of life you are, then it means you are able sometimes to say, oh my God, okay, that opportunity looks amazing, but it, you know, I had a client go through this recently. He's like, the opportunity looks amazing, but it would take me away from my family too much. There'd be too much travel. I'd be working every weekend. And even though the figures involved were staggering, I mean, really quite crazy. He's like, that's not the right thing for me. And he turned it down. But he was able to do that because he's very clear on what's important to him. If you don't take time out to get clear on what's important to you, then you can't make these decisions. 
And actually, I think that is a good thing that came out of the pandemic for a lot of people is they had time on their own, which was hard, but it also led to a lot of reflection and a lot of people thinking about what's really important to them. And it's sometimes it's the money, but generally it's not normally the money. No, I, I think that that that's a great point. And and moving on to this other aspect we've sort of touched on before, uh, this idea of perfectionism. And I think mm. a lot of people are obsessed about it has to be right, it has to be perfect. I mean, what what, what do you think about that in, in terms of careers, Emily? It's interesting because I had a client recently who was ex-armed forces, and we were talking about the fact that we think not enough people are perfectionists anymore. And actually the standards are slipping. But, but certainly there are lots of people out there who are perfectionists in certain areas and they're not willing to, to just move on. They kind of get hung up on doing something perfectly and it slows them down too much. So if you are that kind of person, you need to learn when something is good enough and you need to learn when, when something should be perfect. You know, if I'm putting together a workshop for someone and I'm running a workshop for 200 members of their staff, that PowerPoint better be perfect. Right. And my delivery is not going to be perfect, but it better be really good because that's 200 people's time. And that's an investment that companies make. Whereas if I'm just having a casual conversation with someone, the level of preparation I need for that, I will always prepare. I'll think, what are we talking about? I have a five minute think about it. But the standard is slightly different. So think about when does it matter? When should I channel that perfectionism? But when also is this good enough and I need to move on because, you know, time you know time passes and there's urgency and you know the world of work goes so fast now if you just keep trying to be perfect you'll get left behind equally if you are someone who's not a perfectionist and who kind of rushes things out or or can be a bit careless then that's a, an area for you to work on of, okay when do i need to pay attention when should i stop and check for grammatical errors when do i need to make sure these numbers are right because also that can really damage your brand if you hand over work and it's got errors in it then people think that you don't care about your work that you're not careful with it so you might need to think about when do i need to up my game or when do i need to ask a colleague to check something for me you know if it's not your strong point i think there's a happy medium between these two extremes yeah no no i totally agree there and i think it's very much thinking what type of person are you are you more the extreme perfection side are you more on the uh slightly uh laissez-faire fly by the seat of your pants and then really adapt uh appropriately and, Harsha, and... which one are you which one are you naturally <laughs> well well i think it depends on what it is sometimes i'm more um yeah try and get it perfect but 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 really say with the podcast i thought look just get it out of the door, set a date for it. It doesn't, everything doesn't have to be right. And actually that worked perfectly well. Um, so I think it really does depend. And also you need a bit of luck in life as well. You know, I think we, <laughs> we, we all do. Um, but I think we're, we're coming to the end of our time, Emily, and it's been a fantastic conversation um, as, as, as always. Um, and I think, I think it'd be helpful maybe to share some strategies for people who, you know, out there who are maybe struggling uh, either uh, in the, their current roles or trying to uh, find a new job. Um, any thoughts or strategies about that? Um, any, any suggestions? Well, I think before anyone panics and you kind of rush into just desperately applying for jobs, you need to just stop and take some time out for yourself. And, you know, in my, my coaching mantra, stop, think, grow, you know, stop, try and pause if you can, buy yourself a bit of time, have a weekend away. You know, it's very hard to make job decisions when you're caught up in your job and it, especially if it's high pressure. So just give yourself a bit of breathing space and thinking time and then take thinking time, but not just thinking time. Please talk to people, whether it's a coach or friends that you trust or colleagues who are helpful, but just start talking through what you're struggling with. Don't expect that you have the answer to whatever problem you're going through. Someone else has the answer. Someone else has been through this before you. You know, Harsha's podcast is an amazing source of inspiration. Just start listening, but it's true. Listen to inspiring conversations, read inspiring books, and it can help you work through things. And then you can start taking action, as I said before, about applying for jobs, but also go exploring and be open-minded. Now, sometimes we do have to rush. Sometimes we lose a job and you need a sudden, you know, you need some income. Then don't be afraid to just take a contracting role rather than rushing into the long-term commitment that is a fixed-term contract, unless it's a dream job. Don't kind of rush. It's just like relationships again. Don't rush from one committed relationship to the next one, okay? <laughs> Give yourself a bit of time and freedom. I remember, you know, when I left RBS, consciously saying, I need a bit of time out afterwards. 
I knew I'd start a business, but I hadn't formed the plan. But I just thought I actually need a bit of time out because I've been so involved in that job. And I loved it, but I was so involved in it. I needed my, my brain just needed a time out, a breather. And then I was able to be creative again. It's very hard to be creative under pressure. So if you can buy yourself some time and then don't do this alone, talk to people, get advice, get mentors, get, you know, get mentors you never meet, get YouTube mentors, people who you like their content, listen to inspiring um, mentors every day. I get some of my clients to listen to people like David Goggins to get them fired up in the morning, but find that source of inspiration so that you, you come into this job um, search in a, with a positive mindset feeling positive, feeling confident, rather than coming into a job search from a place of lack and negativity. And, and I, I think there's a great point, Emily. And, and uh, a couple of points I would mention as well is that, you know, sometimes if you're in a bad situation, uh, people extrapolate their, the rest of the, their lives based on that. And I think what you need to say to yourself is, look, this is just the current situation. What's going to happen in the future? I have control to some extent over that. And if you're in a situation where you're not happy, think about, you know, why is it that you're not happy? Is it because of the work? Is it the company? Is it your boss? You know, is it your colleagues? But then once you've identified that, then think, okay, uh, take action. Think about what I can do to get out of that situation. But but actually, um, yeah, don't, don't sometimes don't think too much. Just take those small steps. And by taking mm -hmm. a small step, that, that can make a, a, a big difference difference and then also I think it's about trying to acquire new skills because if you can upskill yourself or just extinguish yourself from the crowd that when you do go to interview or you're trying to uh, expand your network you will find people who maybe think along the same lines as you and that's potentially when new jobs can come about that almost that person they like you and they want to see how can we get Emily on board to work for us and uh, expand our brand and do great things with us. Um, what do you think, Emily? I, I just would, I think I agree with all of that. And I would add one thing is if you can find a way to enjoy the process of looking for a new job. And as you said, enjoy the process of you're going to meet new people. You're going to ask questions about companies and find out interesting things about them. You're, you know, you're going to discover a lot of things. And at the end of it, you may even make some new friends, some new contacts. If you can find a way to enjoy that process. First of all, it will be much more pleasurable for you. And secondly, it will actually be much more successful because when you interview people, you can tell if they're stressed and not having a good time. And that's not an energy you want to bring into your company. And you can also tell the people who are enjoying the interview. You know, some of the best, I've done interviews for companies for their candidates and some of the best interviews, you leave the interview thinking, oh, I wish I had longer with that person. That's a, that's a really good sign when you're interviewing people. I wish I had longer to talk to the person. And, and if you enjoy the process, your interviewer is probably going to enjoy the process as well. So as much as possible, try and find something about it that you enjoy. Or I had one client who really hated kind of looking for jobs online. So I said, okay, well, while you're doing it, create a nice ambiance at home, play some music you like, get a glass of wine with you, but try and do it in a good mood. Try and find a way to be happy while you're doing that. And absolutely that leads to a better outcome. And just one point that struck me when, when, when you were talking here, Emily, is that even if you uh, get rejected by a company, if you've created a good um, sort of relationship or chemistry with that person, I would still try and keep in touch with them because mm. it could come down to, look, either there's a, a compensation issue. It could be that there were three amazing candidates. Um, I mean, say you're uh, interviewing for a, a top investment back or a top hedge fund. I mean, the competition is going to be crazy. But if you've got down to the final stage, then obviously you've done something very right to, to get to that stage. So actually just keep in touch with those individuals because also it might make them feel guilty that if an opportunity does come up in the future, no, I, seriously, I, I, I mean, I, I'm sure you know, I, I rejected some good candidates. I would love to either help them out or do, do something for them later on down the line. So I think don't yeah. burn any bridges because if no. you've got to a, a good stage, then it obviously shows something. Oh, it does. I've, I've rejected candidates and handed them off to other people saying, but this person would be great for you. So I have got people who I rejected jobs elsewhere because I saw they were good. They just weren't quite right for what I wanted. I once interviewed someone for a job and I said to them, I definitely want to work with you, but this is not the right job for you. And they tried to convince me it was. And I said, no, it isn't. 
And what happened when I ended up as head of leadership, I hired them back. At that point, I called them up and I said, it's happened. I've got the right job for you. So you're absolutely right. Just see it as a relationship building opportunity. And you, you know, this is the wonderful thing about a network. Because people move jobs all the time, someone who interviews here may then end up at a job here. And if you stayed in touch and you're in the LinkedIn network and they can see you, they'll suddenly go, wait, I need that person who I interviewed for that job. Let me reach out to them. So it's, it's amazing. The investment you make in your network, it can take one year, 10 years to pay off, but it does pay off. So absolutely see it as that opportunity, an opportunity to build a network and meet interesting people. Yeah, and, and I think this whole idea of you know, growing your network, building relationships, actually just being nice to people, it doesn't hurt. But sometimes I think people are so much in a rush about their careers and they're trying to find people who think that will help them. But actually counterintuitively, it could be the people who are just, you know, in a, in a reception, nobody's talking to them. Uh, go and speak to that person because it could be that he's um, well connected, but he's just an introvert or she is an introvert. So just make that opportunity to reach out to people you don't know. Um, and, th and that may be a source of you know, potential um, jobs or knowledge or whatever. Absolutely. I think be nice to everyone is a pretty good rule. I know people who've done really well at interview, but been rude to someone else on the way in or out of the business and not got the job as a result. They weren't told that, but that's what happened. It's just, it's just generally true in life. There's no harm in being nice to everybody. Brilliant. And, and finally, Emily, um, are there any um, resources or information that you can point people to if they would like to learn more about the stuff that we've talked about, um, careers in general, finding new jobs? I mean, I think our, our podcast that we did, definitely watch that. We talk about that. Um, and I think we talk in the article, we kind of share some of our favourite books as well. So I think you have a look at the Thrive article and the, and the books we've shared there. And really just reach out if you have any questions reach out to myself or harsha because we love talking about this so people can come to us with their, their career questions we might even do a live q a at some point as well yeah we, we are thinking about getting the band uh, together on the road <laughs> for a live. <laughs> i love that that would be great um but 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 in terms of books the things i, I would talk about are you know, carol dweck her fantastic book on mindset uh, robert cialdini his book influence uh, mm. Dory Clark has recently written a book called The Long Game, which talks about the long game in terms of your career and just how to be more strategic. Uh, Christian Bush uh, talking about the serendipity mindset, Grace Lord and Think Big, and uh, finally, uh, Dr. Gabby Tolakita, Why the F Can't I Change? A neuroscientist view on uh, uh, life and careers and various things but yeah and if you don't want to read all those books just watch harsha's podcast because <laughs> he, he meets all these amazing people i really like christian's conversation because there, there is so much serendipity in careers like in my career in your career and in so in so many of my clients the things that happen that almost seem kind of magical but you have to be open to it you know this is exactly what we're talking about you have to be open-minded that things might unfold in a way you didn't expect but it might be probably will be way more wonderful so if that if that's not something you've been thinking about or aware of, I would watch that podcast or read Christian's book as a really good way to start opening your mind to the serendipity available to all of us. And and just our our sort of situation as well, Emily. I mean, you know, it's not as if we you know work together. We literally yeah. met at, at an event. Um, I think we both um, you know liked each other yeah as as individuals. Um, and then you know we didn't you know communicate for a little while, but then you kindly came across my podcast, reached out to me, and then here we are, um, best friends. <laughs> <laughs> but that's it. Reach out to people. Yeah. So many people are afraid of rejection. I mean, you could have just blanked me, Harsha. You could. <laughs> Yeah. fortunately you didn't so here we are well, at that time i wasn't that famous emily so. oh now you're too famous to me, though. i'm now i'm lucky i'm lucky i get to talk to you <laughs> but but emily thank thanks so much for taking the time today uh, yeah it's been such a pleasure and we should definitely um yeah continue uh collaborating together i'm sure i'm sure we will do and i wish everybody who's watched this is the best of luck in your career and I, you know, I do hope you make the most of the resources Harsh has made available to you because they are really inspiring and I'm sure they'll help all of you. Thanks, Emily, and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care, Emily. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.